great honor to award this year's uh, Canadian Hillman Prize to Jamie Poisson and David Bruiser of the Toronto Star for their expose of the ongoing mercury contamination at Grassy Narrows First Nation. 50 years is a long time to wait for justice. It's a long time to live in fear of the land that you live on and the river you rely on. It's also a really long time to be lied to. It was 50 years ago that Dryden Chemicals dropped untreated mercury wastewater into the Wabagoon River. Since then, the people of Grassy Narrows and White Dog First Nations have watched almost everyone they know suffer the effects, all the while being told that there was no more mercury getting into the water and that things were getting better so they couldn't understand why they were still getting sick. It was like that for decades in countless studies and protests and press reports never really changed very much. It wasn't the fault of the people of Grassy Narrows, but it became their problem. The average person simply stopped caring. In fact, the Star's associate editor, Lynn McCauley, when she wrote the cover letter for uh, Jamie and David's story said, their early work about Grassy Narrows wasn't widely read on the website. Now that typically means death in a newsroom these days. But lucky for us, the Toronto Star isn't your average newspaper, and Jamie and David aren't your average person. Investigative journalists aren't like other people. They aren't even like their colleagues in the newsroom. They are passionate about their work, but they're very, very patient. They are highly instinctual, but they pay a tremendous amount of attention to detail. They are inherently skeptical, I would even say suspicious, but at the same time, they are wildly idealistic. They tend to collect vast amounts of paper and never get rid of anything. <laughs> That's just a fact, most of them are pack rats. Over the course of their career, they will add hundreds and maybe thousands of names to their contact lists, but they're not necessarily what you would call social. If you... <laughs> If you go up and ask them what they're working on, you'll just get a, I can't talk about it, secret, not ready yet. But if you ask them when they're ready to talk about it, they will talk your ear off. <laughs> they are brave and they are willing to take enormous risks, but they will be cautious, mostly when they're forced to be. They will spend months and sometimes years, sometimes years on, on a story, knowing full well it may never pan out. But when it does, they're heroes. They change lives and they change the course of history. I think investigative journalism is a calling and it's also a commitment to truth and to righting wrongs, even and maybe especially the ones the wider public seems willing to live with. And if you hear the call and you make the commitment, as Jamie and David have done, then you become the person who finds out where the bodies, or in this case, the barrels of mercury are buried. And you get the report that shows that the government knew that there was more mercury at the site and in the groundwater and didn't clean it up. Knew too that the people of Grassy Narrows were still eating the fish and didn't even tell them about it. And then after 50 years, because of you, people care again and they'll do something about it. Jamie and David, thank you for your commitment to this story and for caring about the people of Grassy Narrows and White Dog, even after the rest of us stopped. Thank you also for your commitment to this profession. This is not an easy time to be a journalist. I do want to tell you, this is the second time that Jamie has won the Canadian Hillman Prize. It's the fifth time that the Toronto Star has been honored here. It's not a coincidence. The Star has invested heavily in investigative journalism it is a leader in the field and a great nurturer of talent. And yet, incredibly, right now, its very survival is in question. We as Canadians need to find a way to save it and all the great investigative journalism that's being done in this country. Besides, the cleanup in Grassy Narrows has not started yet. They and we need Jamie and David to see it through. Congratulations, you two. Please come up and get your prize. It is an honor to receive this award from the, sorry, Bonnie, that was so, that was so nice, you can't cry before my, the speech. Uh, <laughs> it is an honor to receive this award from the Sydney Hillman Foundation, which embodies so much of what we strive for as journalists, to produce journalism that is in service of the public good.
to the judges. We are so grateful for your recognition and for choosing tonight to take the spotlight that this foundation has and to shine in on issues of environmental contamination, of government secrecy and indifference, and of the impact on Indigenous communities. To our fellow honorees, both of whom told their stories in such creative ways. It is truly flattering to be at this event and to be, have our stories named alongside yours. I still think about the price of oil, Team's piece and the, the former oil patch worker, Jeff Crawford, and Vice's powerful piece, uh, Bridget Tolley, Marcus, and the one girl's grandfather who puts rubbing alcohol in the bath to disinfect the water. Uh, we came to this story in the spring of 2016 by way of a tip. A man named Cass Glowacki was claiming that in the 1970s, he was part of a crew that haphazardly dumped drums filled with mercury and salt in a makeshift pit behind the mill. We had his guilt-written guilt email confessing to Indigenous leaders his role in the alleged dumping, but we had no Cass. And as is often the case with journalism, whatever you think is going to be easy ends up being harder. Um, we felt that it was important to check this out because the people of Grassy Narrows had for years been sounding alarm bells that the mercury had affected the health of far more people than originally thought. They feared the contamination was still somehow ongoing. But on the other hand, government official after government official completely rebuffed these concerns. The river, they said, would clean itself naturally. Nothing to see here, folks, is essentially what they said to us. So Kaz would not respond to emails uh, and he, no one by that name was answering the many landlines that were listed under Glowacki that we called, called. But we did get a scrap of information. Uh, he had at one point lived in a small town near Edmonton. So we doorstopped his former neighbors. We begged a pharmacist who had his wife's cell number to call her. We talked to grocery store managers and even an ice truck cream truck driver. We chased his ghost from town to town until we found this reclusive man, himself just a few hours away in Medicine Hat. Um, unlike stories both of us have worked on previously, um, the story has unraveled a thread or two at a time. And our editors at the Star, all of them, um, encouraged us to keep pulling. And so these stories have played out over two years, and it's uh, a patchwork of sorts of 30 stories in all. Uh, that in mid to late 2017 finally started to assemble into a clear, disturbing picture. And very briefly, here's what we now know. The fish downstream from Grassy Narrows are the most mercury contaminated in the province. The sediment in the river is still contaminated by mercury. Top scientists have told us that this strongly suggests the mill site is still leaking the neurotoxin. And on what felt like a possible fool's mission at the time, we literally dug dirt from the, side of where, the site of where Kaz Glowacki said he buried those bar barrels all those years ago. The mission involved going to Canadian Tire down the street from the mill and acting all nonchalant and hoping the hell the cashier didn't wonder why we were buying garden implements on, an, on a weeknight in November. The mission involved us trying to be all nonchalant, getting dropped off on the side of the road on mill property and hoping to hell the mill worker and the crane half a kilometer away didn't notice us scurrying into the bush with shovels stuck up our jackets. <laughs> the mission involved us trespassing on company property where we dug for hours, put the samples in Ziploc bags, and then had them tested at a lab. The results came back 80 times above normal mercury levels for soil in that area. The mission, by the way, was not the first, but the second time I broke the law for a story, and both times are with her. <laughs> <clears throat> the other time involved uh, a little episode where we bought a handgun. <laughs> it gets worse. We put it in a bubble envelope, also with a, um, a typed confession, and mailed it to Atlanta Police Department. Um, so I think we committed two felonies that day. Um, okay, that's another story. Um, we also know now that the government was told in the 1990s that mercury was visible in the soil underneath the old mill, literally pooling in the dirt, like picture Quicksilver. This was all kept secret and the people of Grassy Narrows did not find out about it until this fall. And now the people are finally starting to get back their own historical medical data that has been kept in banker's boxes in the basement of government archive buildings, in some cases for decades. And analyzed through the lens of what we now know today, 
about mercury, the results are high enough to have affected brain development and to cause serious health issues later in life. This story has, as Jamie wrote, I'm stealing her thunder, really pissed us off. Our readers too. We have received dozens of emails from readers that say things like, this would never have been allowed to happen in Brampton or Scarborough or downtown Toronto. This story says a lot about the country's relationship with indigenous people as well as its environmental record. But this story has also shown us the very best of people, which is one of the greatest perks of this job. Uh, the people of Grassy Narrows uh, have given us their time and their trust. They have opened their doors and shared intimate details about their lives. Judy De Silva is a grandmother in the community who has made this her life's work. Pa she has patiently answered questions from us that she has been answering for 40 years. And her niece Amanda is here tonight. We're so happy that she can join us. I don't know where she is right now. As, as just one example of so much assistance that we have received from the community, one young resident, Michael Fobesser, recently took visual journalist Randy Riesling in the middle of winter down uh, an hour down a very untraveled road. To me, was it a road? I don't know. Uh, just so that he could photograph the river from its very best angle. Uh, the people of Grassy Narrows have also, and, and White Dog, have also been supported by advisors and scientists. There's one in particular who wants no spotlight, but without whom we would be lost. He has been tireless in his pursuit for justice for the people of Grassy Narrows. He has been joined by scientists like Faisal Mula and David Suzuki, as well as John Rudd, who began his career advocating for a river cleanup in the 1980s. He was ignored then. And now the province is listening, and he's trying to finish what he started all those years ago. Oops. Oh, sorry. We're almost, we're almost done. We're just, we're almost done. Bear with us, please. Yeah. I'm pulling up an important quote from someone who could not be here tonight. Um, it's important to note that while change has been promised on a cleanup and a mercury home for sick people in Grassy Narrows, nothing has been delivered yet. And as Judy De Silva, who's been mentioned here tonight before already, and who was in the video, says to us um, by email, the fight is not over, she says. Our people are still suffering, and we will need the media to continue shining a light on us for all Canadian society to see while we hold the government accountable to honor their promises and to support us in rebuilding our health, culture, and livelihood from the damage that was caused by mercury. We are grateful to our editors and colleagues at the Toronto Star who feel the same way. Among them, the incomparable Randy Risling for his powerful photos and videos, David Schnittman and Cameron Tulk for all their mapping and other visual work, Evie Kwong for her creativity in sharing the story on social media, Tanya Pereira for her work creating beautiful online packages, Kevin Donovan, our main editor on these stories, he backed the zany idea to fly to Northwestern Ontario just so we could fill Ziploc bags full of dirt. And our editor-in-chief, Michael Cook, got behind it every time and played it big and bold. We were also supported by editors Lynn McCauley, Jennifer Quinn, Amit Shilton, and managing editor Irene Gentle, whose commitment to change-making journalism, oh, blah, whose commitment to change-making journalism is unwavering. Uh, as well, John Hondrick, um, our chairman, John Hondrick, whose enthusiasm and support for these stories has been relentless. And as most of you know, our Michael Cook announced last week that he will be leaving the Star in June. And I just wanted to share this small anecdote with you. Uh, the other week, Michael sent me uh, an email referencing Jacques Hughes, this open letter written in 1898 by Emile Zola in the newspaper Le Roar. People have called this epic, evidence-based piece uh, that essentially accused the government of anti-Semitism and the unlawful jailing of Alfred Dreyfus, the single greatest piece of journalism ever created. So I asked Michael, you know, what is the significance of this piece for him? And his reply to me uh, was simple, and to us perfectly sums up his tenure at the Toronto Star. He wrote, it's about speaking truth to power. So we would like to take this opportunity tonight to thank you, Michael, for giving us this voice and for speaking truth to power for all these years. 